She's an associate professor of nursing in the College of Health Sciences and Management. She previously served as a full professor and director of a new graduate program in nutritional science in Atlanta, Georgia, where I bet she wishes she was today. <laughs> it's only I wish I was there today. <laughs> Dr. Work retains uh, over 20 years teaching experience, including having taught students in the fields of nutrition, dietetics, medicine, and several fields within health sciences, as well as nursing. She also has held several senior administrative appointments, including serving as a chairperson of a board of trustees, vice president for academic affairs, dean of arts and sciences, um, and health sciences, graduate studies, and a department chairperson. She has a BS in microbiology and nutrition from the University of Massachusetts Amherst, a BS uh, in nursing from Creighton, Creighton? Creighton University in Omaha, Nebraska, an MS in health promotion from Russell Sage College in Troy, uh, an MS in nursing leadership with a certificate in nursing education from Regis University, and a PhD in nutrition science from Syracuse University. I give you Dr. Kathy <laughs> I want to really extend my thanks to the provost's office for honoring me in this way to uh, come to speak about my research. Um, anybody that uh, knows a researcher knows that we can talk for hours about research, so I'll try to keep it to the timeline here. And I'd also like to thank you for all coming out today. Um, I know that we were paid on Wednesday, so I think there was probably a Twitter um, Problem and it said that there were um, probably light refreshments instead of light, or uh, light uh, drinks instead of light refreshments. <laughs> you know, I don't know why it really came out on Friday afternoon. <laughs> the last disclaimer that I have is that um, Deb asked me to do this talk during finals week uh, in December. So that was one of the problems here. And um, secondly, she asked me, what are, what are you going to talk about while I'm trying to grade 65 graduate papers? And so I said, well, you know, something about my research, which is on childhood obesity and osteoporosis. And I will talk about that. But as I started to put the presentation together, I thought I really needed to talk about why um, childhood obesity could lead to a big issue with osteoporosis, and so then I had to really, as the educator came out and I had to talk to you about what is obesity versus being overweight, and what are the problems with obesity, etc. So if you will hold on a little bit, I'll talk about this topic, but I need to talk to you a little bit about you know, some of the issues with obesity to kind of set the foundation. So um, you, have to, you have to hang on there for a bit. And that was me, and it still is me. I just <laughs> had this hankering to get to uh, grow my hair for a while, and you'll probably see that come out in me in the, the near future. So um, I did want to set the format a little bit on what I was going to talk about. Um, this legend, by the way, is a legend of recent trends or prevalence of childhood obesity and overweight in our country. So you can get a little bit of. Um, a taste for what we will be talking about in terms of our trends in childhood obesity. I'm going to give you a little bit of introduction to my research background and how that's kind of really uh, helped me in terms of what we're talking about with obesity. Now, I did start out as a bench researcher, and when we talk about where obesity and research in obesity is going in, in uh, the country and in the world today, my bench research is really helping me to understand and be involved in research in obesity uh, in this day and age. And then I want to, as I said, talk why study obesity. Um, in the past, we really uh, blamed, as I would say, blamed the victim. Um, it's somebody else's fault, it's the person's fault that they're obese because they're lazy and they have no willpower. But it's really beyond that. And then I want to talk about relevant research studies that I have conducted. I've been involved in obesity research for probably well over 20 years at this point in time. And then I want to talk a little bit about where I'd like to go at SUNY IT or SUNY Poly now, excuse me, um, in terms of my own research direction. 
So a little bit about me and my background. Um, my initial training was at the University of Massachusetts as an undergraduate student. I actually started out um, with uh, putting my own degree together in um, uh, psychology, nutrition, and exercise physiology. But as life would have it, um, my psychology professor, who was supposed to be my advisor, was not very good. And so I went to the <laughs> yes, I went to our uh, college, which was the bachelor's degree in independent concentration, and I was crying on this professor's shoulder, and I said, I'm going to quit school. I'm done. And he said, why don't you come into my lab? He was a microbiologist. He said, why don't you come into my lab? And that man saved my career and probably put me in academia today. He took me into the lab. He taught me how to streak plates. And he, became, he made me a microbiologist. And at the end of my degree at the University of Massachusetts, I did an honors thesis. I published. I presented at the Association for Microbiology, American Association for Microbiology, and I did a publication on uh, macrophage secretions and how they um, change the uh, adhesivity of platelets. And if you know anything about um, obesity study right now, what they're thinking about obesity is that it's a meta-inflammation situation, that people that are obese are in a constant state of inflammation. And those macrophage secretions, or that state of inflammation, leads to uh, uh, an increased uh, state of adhesiveness, which is a result of that inflammation. So way back when I was at UMass, I was studying obesity, okay? And from there, I uh, thought, he, he asked me, well, what do you want to do when you leave? I actually started a master's degree at Smith College in microbiology, but Smith College didn't like students from UMass, and I couldn't tolerate that. <laughs> so I said, well, I want to go into, you know, I want to go into medicine. He said, well, nursing is a fine profession. And so I went into nursing, and I went to a school in uh, Omaha, Nebraska, that was a one-year program. You had to have a baccalaureate for me to go in there. And I started out on a clinical floor in, uh, in Long Island, at Long Island Jewish. And the floor was a uh, progressive unit, a step-down unit in uh, ICU. And each patient on there, about 65 to 70% of the patients, had had gastric bypass surgery. For obesity. The average uh, weight of our patient was about 400 pounds. We had one patient that was 900 pounds, the husband. The wife was 500 pounds, and the daughter was 350 pounds. Okay? And at that time, and that was, I would hate to tell you when that was, because I'm really only 25 years old, but that was in the early 80s. And at that time, they didn't do any counseling or they didn't de do any pre-op assessment for the psychological preparation for those patients. You know, you go in, you want bypass surgery, you have bypass surgery. But how many of those patients really did well after the surgery? Not too many of them. They would regain. Okay? So it started setting me up for really wanting to study and, and help those patients do better after. And remember, I had my first degree was in microbiology. <coughs> And I was really always wanting to study obesity and weight loss. So um, we left Log Island, my husband and I. We came up to Alden Bed and I started working as an ER nurse. And everything that came in the ER to me was somebody that, um, you know, we prepped them, we stabilized them, we sent them off to the OR. And it was people that drank too much, smoked too much, partied too much, ate too much, and didn't exercise. So I went back and I finished my registered dietitian credentials because I wasn't really helping my patients in preventing them come, from coming into the ER. That's why I became a registered dietitian because I really wanted to do more with my patients in helping them to prevent what they were doing. Okay, so that's why I combined nutrition and nursing. And um, to move on, I eventually got my PhD at Syracuse. My research was in 
looking at the differences between bow density and swimmers versus runners because at the time we were, we were thinking that swimmers would have lower bone density than runners because it was a non-weight bearing activity. And I also looked at calcium supplementation versus non-calcium supplementation in that same population over one year. What did I find? Swimmers have higher bone density in the wrist than runners, significantly higher. And um, that uh, calcium over one year, 21 year olds, doesn't do anything. So as any good researcher would do, you extend that research on and decide that, you know, it's the wrist, it's not the weight bearing, it's the muscle, it's something going on. So when I went to the University of Cincinnati and beyond, I said, I need to really look at obesity. You know, is it, is it the weight? Is it something in the muscle? Is it estrogen that's being secreted from body fat that may be helping the bone? And that's where I got to children, wanting to help children when they're accruing most of their bone, helping them lose weight, but also helping them maintain their bone. Okay, so that's that's kind of a long scenario of where I, I've gotten to my research today. So to talk to you a little bit, a lot of people don't understand the difference between obesity and, and uh, being overweight. Um, obesity basically, or how we define ob obesity versus being overweight is by body mass index. And body mass index is basically looking at somebody's weight in kilograms divided by their height in meters squared. Okay? Everybody uses body mass index. And it's a good um, measurement for epidemiological studies. But it is not a measurement for clinical uh, assessment. Does anybody know why it's not a good measurement for clinical assessment? I mean, if the CDC uses it, it's great. But if you as a clinician go in and assess a patient, a patient why wouldn't you use BMI? I do have surprises if you know the answer. <laughs> okay. When I was at Syracuse University and I was teaching, I taught health promotion, I got my PhD in, in human uh, development. We had two dancers that were teaching in the dance program. Obviously, two dance teachers are going to be in good shape, correct? One loved donuts, the other one was a uh, vegetarian, basically. She ate whole grain, she ate all good food. The other one loved donuts, ate crap all the time. They were good dancers, they were both beautiful, and they were both visually very good. We did uh, body composition on them, which I'll talk about body composition later on. One of them, her body composition, her body fat was 9%. The other one's body fat was 25%. Mm -hmm. Whose was 25%? Whose was 9%? Mm -hmm. The one that ate the vegetarian diet was 9%. The other one was 25%. The one that ate the crab. Because when you use BMI, you don't know what their visceral body fat stores are. You only know what their height and weight is. It's a measurement of height and weight. It's not a measurement of body fat. Mm -hmm. And what determines somebody's cardiovascular health? Their visceral body fat. So the EMI, when we talk about obesity and overweight in general, is measured by BMI. But it's not going to tell you what somebody's health status is. And health status, it, we can look at BMI, somebody that's overweight or underweight. Underweight, a BMI is less than 18.5%. And being underweight is just as detrimental as being overweight. Okay? So a healthy weight is a BMI between 18.5 and 24.9. And anything between 25 and 29 is being overweight. Okay? And then anything over 30 is being obese. And to give you some statistics, for every five unit increase in BMI, you have a 29% increase in mortality, you have a 41% increase in vascular mortality, and you have a 210% increase in diabetes for every five unit increase in BMI. Again, epidemiological information. But that doesn't tell you if you have a weightlifter who has a high BMI, it's not telling you anything about their lean body mass, 
versus their body fat. Okay, so you can't, it's a, it's a general piece of information, it's not telling you anything about their body composition. Okay, so somewhat quickly I want to go through obesity trends because I find this data is pretty, pretty interesting. And I'm going to go from 1985 to uh, 2010 and it shows you some pretty uh, drastic changes in our country. Um, and one of the things, particularly I think for um, uh, like for the business people and for demographers, etc., one of the things you want to really think about, which I haven't pointed out here, is that, for instance, in 9-11, uh, uh, the, the um, increase in the sales of comfort food was dramatic after 9-11, which could result in a great increase in obesity and overweight. In our obesity and overweight population. So this data again was from the CDC. You can look at it at the CDC website. It's self-reported, so you have to take that into account. And these are prevalence estimates. Okay, Is, who can tell me the difference between prevalence and incidence data? Somebody here's got to know the difference between prevalence and incidence. Well, I'm pulling this kind of stuff. Right? Prevalence is all of the cases? Prevalence is new and old cases. Incidence is only new cases. So when we're talking about the measles, measles would be all that we talk, we'd be talking incidence. With prevalence, we'd be talking new and old cases. So, you know, somewhat quickly I'm going to go through these. Let's see, I guess I have to bring a slideshow up. Does Mary Lou get a prize? What's her prize? She can't see. Okay. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> now, just so that you know, to work towards something. Now, this is the this is the grand uh, prize. Uh, uh, okay. 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 So, if you look, 1985, and the legend is down here at the right. Okay. We have <coughs> 1985 and let me and, and uh, we're going to start that but we have um, we have uh, very few people that are very too few uh, states that are um, that are reporting out any obesity and certainly in the Midwest here Colorado was one state you kind of want to watch because Colorado was a holdout for a long time in terms of reporting any obesity then in 1990, 10 states reported obesity. There was less than 10% obesity in 1990. Okay, Zero states had obesity of greater than or equal to 15% in 1990. 1995, only five years. Now we're looking at um, many of the states with 15 to 19%. The South, Midwest. Pennsylvania added in there, and then New England, New York, 10 to 15 percent or 10 to 14 percent, and look at all these states in the West. 1998, three years, and now we've added Alaska's in there, greater than 20. The South again, the South is uh, has been a real problem in terms of obesity. West Virginia, they're a big problem. One year, one year, 2,000, 2,000 zero states at less than 10%, 23 states at 20 to 24%, zero at less than, uh, less than greater than 25. One year, Mississippi, Mississippi's been a, a a state where they were looking at, uh, I don't know whether any of you heard about the fat tax. Mississippi was looking at implementing a fat tax. And I'll talk about that later. Another year. A couple more years. I mean, these are just a couple years. Yeah, we 
news coming? <laughs> Is there a good news coming? You know, like, huge 2012 and something. I'm just going to have a sad movie. It gets more brown. <laughs> yeah, I know. So, uh, and I just... Before you go on, go I have a question. Is that an indication of people becoming more fat, or is that an indication of better collection of data, or more honest yes. reporting, or it's really people becoming more fat? We hate that. Well, okay, so it's both. We're still. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we are we are collecting better data, but remember, this was self-report, so it's probably underestimated. She's driving me to drink. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and um, this is by ethnicity, oh, race and ethnicity yeah. by state, and um, which is a very important uh, piece of information. Again, this was a this was three years of data, so that we had uh, sufficient sample size. Again, BMI calculations self-reported. Um, and because of we, we needed sample size here, uh, these are the exclusion criteria. So uh, you see the exclusion criteria. Yeah, not too many. Um, uh, this is just by uh, non-Hispanic white adults. So and we're we're talking about uh, ethnicity here. So here you see between 2011 and 2013. And there is a significant correlation between ethnicity and obesity. And this just gives you, an, and I, you can look these up on the CDC website, so I'm just running through them pretty quickly. Um, just the data. And this is uh, non-Hispanic blacks. Um, the African American, um, there is a, um, a value um, or a cultural uh, uh, bias towards uh, a larger uh, body frame. So it's not, it wouldn't be, um, uh, unusual to see more obesity in the black population. But again, I'm going to talk about comorbidities. So, um, you know, that's not a good thing either. Question? Hey, Kelly, just a, um, as I mentioned to you, this is 10 years old, but we were involved in a study looking at early childhood um, obesity and prevention of it. And at that time, um, we it was also thought that the Latino population um, valued better children chunkier because it was a sign of economic um, prosperity. prosperity. And here's and, Latinos. Oh, sorry. Right. And the other thing which you might or might be going to mention, but I'm just curious about the current data, is again the time frame from '85 to um, 2000 was when there was an enhanced media time related to the evolution of the um, internet. And that was, at that time, the highest correlate with obesity, and it was only a correlate, was um, um, TV immediate time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm going to talk about that. Good. This is, um, so this is just some data. Again, you can, if you want to look at it, you can look at it on the CDC website, but I think it's important data to talk about the different trends. So let me see where I was. And I think just to um, just to go along with that, when I was doing, I did um, some work at Ohio Department of Health, um, and you know certainly those ethnic groups. But I I'm from a German population, and I was I was heavy. I lost 100 pounds when I was in, in junior high, and um, you know my father, you know I go work at his office when I was young, and it was nothing for him to bring home or to the office um, a dozen Dunkin' Donuts for me because I did a good job working. And when I was working at Ohio Department of Health, I was I was working with a sort of registered dietitian. Um, and this one woman, um, she said, I'm working with this Hardin County in Ohio. And she said, I, you know, she's taking hikes and weights on the children there. And she said, like, I send these notes home to the parents and I can't figure out what to do with me. They won't do anything. They won't take their kids to the, the pediatrician. And I, you know, I did some work, I did a search, and I said, they're German. <laughs> I said, Germans think it's a good thing to have big kids. That means that the father is a good provider. You know, so you got to understand the cultural aspect 
you know, if you know, if uh, if the family or it, like the African American, it, it, it means that they're good providers. You've got to break through that. You have to understand that in order to make a difference in the healthcare of the population. So. Um, so, uh, overall, the statistics of obesity in this country, you see it right here, Americans versus Canadians. My son right now, my middle son is in Japan, and I want to give you a little bit of information because it's, it's an it's a overall issue as you bring up, Kathleen. In Japan, if you want to compare this to Japan, the BMI, there's 3.6 uh, Japanese individuals that have a BMI of greater than 30. 3.6. 3.6. Make sure I heard you right. 24.7 of the Japanese individuals have a BMI over 25. Um, um, in Japan, the average Japanese individual consumes uh, 200 calories less than the average American individual because the, the prices of food in Japan are a lot more expensive. My son was, uh, he was, um, FaceTiming me and he said, Mom, I go to the grocery store and I get these boxes of, he says, I get the big box. See, it says the big box of cereal. The big box of cereal is smaller than the small box of our cereal. And they also walk a lot more. And walking is highly correlated with uh, lower obesity rates. For instance, when I talked about Colorado, which was the last holdout state in, our, in the United States to show a rate of obesity. The average Coloradan walks 3.4 miles a day. The Amish walk an average of 9 miles a day. My daughter lives in Chicago. If you live in Chicago or you live in New York City, you don't see a lot of obese individuals. When I go visit my daughter, I'm exhausted. <laughs> we're walking up to get the L, we're walking down to get the L, we're running to get the L, we're running to get a cab. You walk everywhere. Yeah. <coughs> Yesterday night, on two nights before, I was uh, came, I think it was Canadian broadcast, talking about the design of the cities and how the basically the suburban type of areas people wanted to have detached homes and big in suburbia because they wanted to move their families there and how that is actually unhealthy that those families ended up living out in nice green places but they drove everywhere they were not walking everywhere and the, basically the city planners and city designers did extremely poor jobs on having cities where you would walk and having really rather you know the combination of shopping and housing together as you have in some you know boston new york city uh some of the you know canadian cities you go to a lot of european places much more uh, you know uh compact and you have the walking i think yeah, that was a very interesting it was from the urban development point of view i think it was yesterday or the night two nights before we were watching it and yeah that makes sense you know it's sort of all the things you know, I mean, I can't believe I live in a place where we need two cars and I can't walk for bread. Where I come from, that's unheard of. Right. You know, you can't walk to get a loaf of bread because that would be, you know, half a day trip almost. And right. that's just, that's just wrong with the urban design. So I think it's a whole thing, you know, the society, the urban design, um, you know, that there's more contributing to it. But the walking in the cities is a big thing. Right, right. Well, that's what we call, we're going to talk about an obesogenic environment. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, and thank you for bringing that up because it's very true. That's what's led to a lot of this too. So, uh, obesity is no laughing matter. It's very costly. It's costing us a lot of money. Um, in general, as you see the figures here for cardiovascular disease, and these are obesity related, three, uh, $5.3 million, diabetes, and these are just general figures, um, and cancer. Um, and also, uh, I have some, I is, uh, going back to some of these relationships to taxes, uh, Mississippi was looking at uh, charging a fat tax because they figured that they could make money off of taxes and reduce the rate of obesity. Um, New York City, I think you uh, remember the discussion on no baby sized drinks. Um, and then there was also a discussion on the Personal Responsibility and Food Consumption Act that was a discussion in Congress. 
Um, there was a report made out of, that was put out that we could put out a 20% tax on sugary beverages, beverages and we would reduce obesity levels by 3.5%. And then an 18% tax on pizza and soda, and we would uh, get the average American to lose five pounds for, um, for uh, a more healthful um, diet. So, um, and in, in this regard too, the, the average cost of treating an obese individual in general is about 42% higher than treating a normal weight individual. And it outranks, the cost of treating an obese individual outranks individuals that smoke and drink alcohol. And again, some of that is due to the chronic inflammation of obesity. Um, and here you see too, also, when compared to smoking years, uh, and I have the reference in the back, I can't remember the exact reference, but when compared to smoking years, every uh, year of obesity is as equally damaging as smoking. Um, there's some research on that. For every two pounds of weight increase, an individual experienced 9 to 13% increase in arthritis. And uh, more sleep apnea and, I, and a higher prevalence of asthma. A lot of people are on CPAP now because of obesity. And also, there's some really interesting data in the psychology literature that obese individuals um, rank below embezzlers, cocaine users, and shoplifters in regard to discrimination. And that's involved. And then the unknown costs. And I put this in here because I remember that uh, when, I, uh, when I worked in that unit at Long Island Jewish, and that was a long time ago, um, we had a special bed for our 900 pound patient. And we had special stairs to get up so we could suction him. Okay? And that was a long time ago. That was before the 85 and 90 and 95 and 2000. Uh, my surgeon friends tell me that all the OR suites now are outfitted with different OR tables to deal with because most of the patients coming in are obese. So all healthcare dollars and costs have increased because of our obesity problem. Yeah. The waiting rooms, at least in the mm -hmm. medical facilities and working with have bigger size chairs mm -hmm. now. And I know when I was an administrator, it was nothing for us. And even when I was in Atlanta, we were re-outfitting all of our rooms because we couldn't use normal sized desks anymore. And this was a, a chiropractic call. Mm -hmm. Well, on those same lines, um, the, my husband's health centers, they just built a new health center, that's it, and they put in two two um, procedure rooms, uh, clinic rooms that were for their large patients. But more more impressive um, to me was one of my graduate level research students last year um, wrote a paper looking at um, the impact of um, in the OR of a proposal. So it was looking at injuries within healthcare workers, specifically within the operating room, related to um, um, the increased numbers of those of, of these people, and um, compared what was doing in her institution to um, OSHA guidelines. And now there are specific OSHA guidelines, which I guess are mandatory for lifting, and you have to get certain devices um, that then goes back to the cost of the OR for transferring patients, turning them, et cetera, et cetera. So, and then to um, talk about children, we've been talking about adults. Um, in children, um, they have similar comorbidities, um, increased blood pressure, cholesterol, and so risk for cardiovascular disease, um, impaired glucose tolerance. We're seeing a lot more diabetes in children. Um, again, sleep apnea and, and asthma, joint and musculoskeletal issues, uh, fatty liver, etc. This is the first generation of children that are not expected to outlive their, their parents. And uh, four years ago, I worked as a nurse at a summer camp up in the Adirondacks, and this was a high-end camp. So we didn't see a lot of obesity, but we saw about two-thirds of our kids were on medication for depression. 
um, uh, about half of those children, 250 children in a, in a session, were had food allergies, and um, four of the kids were taking growth hormone to prevent obesity. And I had another four children that are five children that were diabetic. Out of 250 kids in a three-week period. And this was a very high-end camp. Um, I could talk down there. <laughs> but I won't. I don't know. That's a little scary. And then just more statistics on kids. Um, you know, we have 17 percent of children that are uh, that are in adolescence that are obese. Um, it is. It has uh, decreased slightly, but I mean, we're looking at slightly. And again, it's more prevalent in the Spanish and non-Spanish black populations. Um, the non-Spanish Asian population, um, the lower, there is lower present prevalence. And then, um, when you're looking at obesity in children, you're looking at um, you know, BMI above 95% of the sex-specific age groups on the birth charts. And then um, a couple other factors. Um, if the parents have gone to college, um, children are less likely to be obese. Um, and um, um, also, obesity is related to maternal obesity um, and the age of onset. There's very interesting information. There's three periods of uh, growth during uh, that a child is more likely to become obese certainly during the prenatal period. There's something called adiposity rebound between four and six years of age. If a child becomes obese during, or starts to gain a lot of weight during four to six years of age, which is the adiposity rebound period, they're much more likely to have obesity problems. And then during adolescence um, is a period where kids are much more likely to have obesity problems if they start to gain weight during and they did, uh, there was a lot of research that I was looking at that uh, it's tied, obesity is tied much more to the mother than to the father, so the fathers get off on this one. And then um, uh, poverty is certainly um, a rela is related or correlated to obesity. The higher the income, the lower the obesity. Okay? This may be related to, and I will talk a little bit about some of my research on food addictions and refined sugars. Um, I had a speaker when I was down in Atlanta who was from, who was a Native American and he was on the Sioux Reservation in South, uh, South Dakota and so much uh, prevalence of uh, diabetes on some of these reservations where they um, are getting, um, they're getting a lot of refined foods from the government and there's so much that you can show correlations between the, the, the the uh, consumption of refined foods and food addiction and then higher rates for these uh, diabetes and obesity. Kathleen, your, your income to poverty ratio, I'm not familiar with that. Is it better to be higher or lower? <laughs> yeah, right. It's actually the, the higher <coughs> the this income. one up here is that you're, you have a higher income. Then I noticed the bottom one is the ratio is highest, so that means it's the lowest yeah, income. Lower income. So their numbers are dropped because they right. actually just don't have enough <coughs> to buy food. Right. Okay. And this is CDC data. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And I think I just talked about it. Oh, and I talked about the Native Americans and, uh, and some of that. Okay. So now we're getting to this. Houston, we have a problem. Okay? And why I say that is because I think we have so long kind of put obesity on the shoulders of the obese individual that, uh, first of all, you know, it is an equation, the body looks at it as an equation is that um, the calories go in and the calories burn. It is a simple equation for the body. But as you said, Zoya, it's, um, it's an obesogenic environment, and I'm going to talk about these. It's, you know, where do you live and, you know, are you, are you tied up to, with technology and a lot of our kids do. They say it's not a safe environment to go out. A lot of kids are latchkey kids so they stay home and they're tied, they're connected with the computers because mom doesn't want you to go out. Um, there are not a lot of sidewalks anymore. So people don't have a place to walk. 
I walk my dog around the neighborhood, and I don't know how many times I've fallen because of the unsteady sidewalks and, the, and all of the ice, etc. So, you know, where do they go to? Where do kids go to play? Where is it safe? Etc. Um, there are a lot of biochemical factors that I will talk about. We know more about leptin, ghrelin, um, uh, uh, adipocytes. You know, we know a lot more about what is going on. For instance, if a person has um, bypass surgery, ruin Y. There's so much data that shows when you have ruin Y, which is a, basically a bypass surgery, not only do you, um, you know, your, your whole biochemical system change, but you lose leptin which is supposed to suppress your appetite. Mm -hmm. So if you lose leptin, you're not suppressing your appetite. Okay? And then we know a lot more about epigenetics. That's what I was teaching down in Atlanta. We know that if my grandmother ate the wrong thing, I may be screwed up for the rest of my life. That may be the problem. See, it was my mother's fault. Yeah. Yeah. It was my mother's fault. Right? <laughs> and, we, and, we, and we are starting to learn the importance of interprofessional health education. The whole team needs to know the importance of nutrition and know when to do a turf to the to the nutritionist or somebody else. So this is um, this is the obesogenic environment. So uh, which is uh, much more important now. It's the rise in, in the cost of health care. It's the um, it's the lack of sidewalks. It's the technology, which can be good and bad. We're learning now that technology, and we talk about nanotechnology, we, we are knowing now that we can develop these nanoparticles that may be influential in helping reduce the level of obesity. Okay? Leptin is one of them. We can give people leptin, we can replace leptin, and that helps um, control or suppress their appetite. One of the other areas that we're looking at, too, is brown adipose. Anybody heard of brown adipose? We have not known for a long time what brown adipose does. We know that in infants, they use brown adipose. Brown adipose has is brown versus yellow adipose, which we have a lot of. Many people, particularly obese people, have yellow adipose, which doesn't have a lot of energy, and it has a lot of triglycerols in it. That's where we store our fat. But brown adipose has a lot of mitochondria. And in infants, it keeps them warm. In bears, it keeps them warm, and that's what they use to hibernate. But in adults, we know we have some brown adipose tissue, but we don't know what it does for us. Now, with nanotechnology, they're starting to see if they can manipulate brown adipose tissue to do the benefit of adults to help um, uh, increase energy production or increase energy use actually. So there, you know, with biology and biochemistry, we're learning that we may be able to make better use of the what the body has. Molecular regulation. Okay, as I said, leptin is, is secreted from the adipose tissue and it's supposed to inhibit food intake. But um, in some individuals, um, obese individuals, it seems to, to downregulate. Or if people have a bypass, if they have bypass to lose weight, they lose some of their leptin. Ghrelin is an, a neuropeptide that actually regulates hunger and opposes leptin. So it turns on your appetite. And some of these we've known have been around. If you know the if you know the GI system and how it controls your body when you eat, we've had some of these around, like peptide YY has been around for a long time. Um, Adiponectin is, is a peptide or a protein that regulates glucose and it also is involved in fatty acid oxidation. I want to make sure I get some of these things discussed. So um, with uh, ghrelin, we know that exercise, if you, we've, seen, we've done some exercise studies, or some people, not me, have demonstrated that you, if you increase the intensity and duration of exercise, we can actually suppress the ghrelin. So we can suppress the hunger or uh, the hunger that develops from its, um, its secretion. 
Um, intensity and duration for those that you are that are not exercise physi physiologists. Intensity, the higher the intensity. Um, for instance, if you were to uh, uh, exercise physiologists, a lot of times will want you to do an intensity of like 60 to 65 percent. And if you're doing an intensity of 60 to 65 percent, usually you're starting to burn fat. Whereas you go up to 70, 80, 90 percent, then you have to burn glucose in order to get the energy. So the higher the intensity, um, the more that uh, they were able to show that you're going to be able to suppress the ghrelin, okay? And the longer the duration, meaning the, you know, the longer you do this for, the more you're able to suppress this uh, protein. And uh, the hypothesis is, was that you were probably um, uh, turning on the sympathetic nervous system. So um, the sympathetic nervous system is diverting uh, neurons away from them. Peptide YY is uh, secreted from the small intestines, and it uh, is a suppressant of the gastric acid and the peptide juices. And after a ruin Y, just like leptin, the peptide YY decreases as well. So you see a waking. And then epigenetics. Um, blame your relatives. Um, epi epigenetics is an interesting area that's really starting to come on its own. What it's showing is that um, that um, if you had critical uh, deficits in, say, uh, folate, uh, vitamin B12, vitamin B6, at critical junctures when you were developing your genes, you may live, you may have a lifetime in, in generations down the road. And some of the uh, research in this is looking at uh, Irish famine families and showing that there's going to be critical junctures throughout the life cycle of some of these problems. So it's a really interesting area of study at this point in time. And what it is is um, uh, uh, methylation reactions that they're looking at. Vitamin B12, folate, and B6 are all important for methylation reactions, one carbon methylation reactions. So if you're absent, like when you, you say you need folate or you need vitamin B12 for um, pregnancy, if they are absent from long ago, then you're going to have problems with your genes throughout the next several generations. And then this is a slide from um, the American College of um, Nursing. Uh, where did I put this? From the Amer American Association of College of Nursing, which uh, identifies the criteria for interprofessional education in nursing. Um, I've been involved in this uh, group for not for in nursing, but in Canada and Great Britain for a long time because I had a doctoral student in Canada that defined all of the uh, criteria and language for this. And basically what it is, is um, it is uh, getting together with other healthcare professionals and teaching all healthcare professionals how to work together on um, any kind of disease state, whether it be AIDS, whether it be obesity, etc. So when you're treating a patient, if you're treating an obese patient, you're working together uh, for the good of the patient rather than just putting up turf barriers. You're trying to work on what does the patient need and how can we work as colleagues together. And um, I think and these are the criteria that nursing has put forth. And I think that we really all need to get together and work together for the good of the patient in that area. So now I've gone to um, the point where I'm going to talk about my research studies, and there are really three of them. There's one on body fat weight loss, which we're just uh, uh, put in for publication, we've got accepted for publication. There's an area on food addictions, and then the one on stress man management and weight loss is really together with the influences on bone density. So um, the one that we're just publishing uh, on body fat weight loss has got some really unique features. It looks at, first of all, it focused on reducing insulin response to glucose, um, forcing lipolysis, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And instead of measuring uh, weight, we measured body fat. We didn't look at weight, we looked at body fat. And again, if you think about what I talked about before, 
we're not we're not focused on weight because what does weight tell us? It doesn't tell us anything for body fat will. And then we were we had a significant level of client provider interaction every day. The clients were contacted, and that's what really um, uh, helped the clients stay on the program. So just to make sure that you remember all of the um, biochemistry that you learned in biochemistry class, remember there's a price right on this. Okay. Glycolysis, lipolysis, and gluconeogenesis. Um, glycolysis should be easy. Remember we're breaking glucose down to uh, pyruvate or energy and then we can go on into the, um, and then we can break it down to ATP. Uh, but what's lipolysis? Break down fat. Break down fat. We're breaking down fat to um, to uh, fatty acids and glycerol. And glycerol is what we can use for energy. Okay. And then what's gluconeogenesis? That's the real prize. Mm -hmm. Picture right there. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. Gluconeogenesis. These are the, the the reason we have all these is what? That's the major point of all of these. Storing energy. Storing energy. energy. <laughs> giving energy. Okay. Giving energy. The major point of all these is that we need glucose. We need an even level of glucose in our blood so that we can survive. Okay? So each one of these is going to give us an even level of glucose. The first one, glycolysis, is going to make sure that we have glucose, but we run out of if we can't if we can't run glycolysis, we can usually we're going to run gluconeogenesis, which is the opposite of glycolysis. We're either going to burn glycerol, lactate, pyruvate, or glucogenic amino acids. Okay, so it's just the it's just the opposite of glycolysis. And then if that's not there, then we're going to force lipolysis, and that's what this study did. As we broke down, we broke down the fats in our adipose tissue. And then we took the we took the glycerol through the glucogenic amino uh, uh, glucogen, you know what I said. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when you're on the spot, it's hard. So, and the other thing we did, so we forced uh, lipolysis in the glucogenic amino acid cycle. So the other thing that we did was that we put these uh, patients or these subjects all on a high protein, moderate fat, low carbohydrate diet. Okay? And the way that we were able to tell whether they were lying to us or not is that we did a, a metabolic stress test and we tested their RQ value, which was the respiratory quotient. And here's the respiratory quotient. So if they were lying and they started taking, they started eating a lot of carbohydrates, or they ate a mixed diet, then we would get their RQ value because we were doing a stress test on them and we had them on a metabolic carb. So if they were eating what we told them to eat, then we'd get an RQ value of 7 to 8. So they couldn't lie to us. And that's, it's, it's almost like testing lab rats, Because okay? <laughs> when you're doing clinical studies, the worst thing about clinical studies is mm -hmm. the patient's lying. Okay? So, then we, um, as I said before, we, we tested body composition, and we tested body composition with the body pod. Okay? And I wanted to talk to you a little bit about body composition because I, I made a point of body composition being the best thing to do. There's lots of ways to test body composition. You can do um, skin full calipers, which a lot of dietitians use. But you have to have either laying calipers, which are about $5,000, and you have to test body with uh, calipers all the time, and you have to be very good at it. And if you have super obese people, it's very hard to get a good skin full caliper reading. And I mean, you have to do this all the time. Or you can do hydrostatic weighing, which I did on my subjects when I did my dissertation. But I'll tell you, if you try to get a, a swimmer in a tank, or a runner in a tank, they look like drowned fish. So and it's very expensive to get a tank, and it's very, it's very hard to blow out all your oxygen, because you have to get in a tank, and you have to blow out all your oxygen. And um, it's a very difficult process to do. The, the uh, hydrostatic tank and the bod pod are based on the same principles. So this seems, look at this lady, she's very happy. <laughs> and she doesn't have to get in water, and it's much easier to do. So this was 
much easier to process. Do you close yeah. her in there? Well, if you want another, this one is the BIA of bioethical impedance. This is very easy to do. However, you can't do it on kids because it's very sensitive to body water measurements. And kids change their body comp water composition a lot. And so you have to be you hydrated, normally hydrated. If you're over or under hydrated, your measurement will come. However, this piece of equipment, which I've bought several of them, is just the, it just costs about seventy-five hundred thousand dollars. It's not really expensive. <laughs> this is a DEXA scanner, and this this wonderful piece of equipment yeah. is uh, will do not only body fat and it'll do visceral body fat, but it does bone density. Mm -hmm. So, and this will scan you in the course of uh, five to ten minutes. And so it's. It's a good piece of equipment to have if you want to do both. Can you use that one for children? You can do it, yeah. And it's minimal radiation, which is a nice thing. Mm -hmm. So that, that's what I'll, well, this is what I did for all of my um, bone density research, so you know what it looks like. This is a metabolic cart, which you, you uh, set up to a, um, a treadmill. And so this is what we did all our, our cues on. Tell me, how does the pod work? What does it do? The bod pod basically, um, instead of, uh, you, you, you have to determine, both of these are based on Boyle's Law, which is long in um, mm -hmm. physics and everything. But basically you're measuring the air in somebody's lungs, and then um, and you get their height, and you get their weight, and so, and then you close that, that person in there, and it knows what air is in there, and it knows what air is in the lungs. And then um, and it knows what you know with the weight of that. Sometimes they um, they'll measure with no clothes on. You know what the weight of that um, swimsuit is too. So you know you have all the weight parameters as well. And then it takes all of those uh, measurements into account. And then the computer does all the work. And how long does you have to be in the clothes on? Um, it takes a matter of three minutes at the most. Well, it's not that long. That's okay, Debbie. You can do that. <laughs> There's a window. I was thinking about window. Yeah, it's a window. These are not. Um, and you don't have to do anything. Just sit there. And not, yeah. Not go hysterical. My husband can't get it. Yeah. My husband can't get it. Good point. <laughs> I think it's. Uh, these have just gone up. They used to be like forty-eight thousand. I think they're fifty-five now for a piece of equipment. Yeah. But they're they're nice pieces of equipment. They just came out in the late eighties, early nineties. And the research I work with in Chicago bought the first. So it's just so that you know what body fat, normal body fat should be. You know, everybody has essential body fat. Of course, women have more um, because of the reproductive function. Men have less. Athletes, this would be um, a, a, an athlete. And these are like regular athletes. If you look at elite athletes, they're going to be on the lower end of that. I've seen, again, I've seen elite female athletes because I used to work with a lot of them that were 7 to 9%. Mm -hmm. And then if they're going to be 7 to 9%, they're going to be amenorrhea. Mm -hmm. okay, so these are, these are ranges. Okay? And then uh, fitness, and then average levels. And these are high. Um, I would say that women average levels, these are like average population. I would say women generally should be um, between 17 and maybe 25. So these are pretty high. So these are average charts. So your essential is what everybody needs? Everybody needs. Yeah. And then, and, uh, and, you know, because women are going to have a visceral body fat. Yeah. I'll store the estrogen. And then, as I said, with this program, uh, we were contacting uh, the subjects every day. And they saw the, the researcher once a week. They'd go over the program. And once a month, they would get a metabolic cart and they would get the bot talk. So that really kept them on program. Okay. So this was the starting, these were their starting uh, uh, demographics, the average age was in the 40s, um, height and weight, and if you look at the body fat here, it was 80%. So that's high body fat. And these are just differences here. So if you look at the um, differences, and percent loss of body fat, 57% for females, 
and 67% for males. And then um, we did three levels of carbohydrate restriction. So the low level of carbohydrate restriction was 53% up to 70, almost 71% for high carbohydrate restriction. And it, with this high carbohydrate restriction, we were looking at any type of sugar in the diet. If there was a cheese that had any kind of starch, corn starch in it, it was restricted from the diet. How long were you able to um, get your subjects to adhere to a diet like that? So I've read that that is a challenge to maintain more restrictive diets and to maintain. Six months to a year. Wow. wow. Is that how long you get them on those studies? Or how long was the program itself? The, the program, it, it depends on how long they want to stay on it, you know, because it, it depends on their weight loss. But they were on it from six months to a year. So it was variable. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then after that year, you would be measured again. We, we would measure them like every month. After the years? Yeah. We um, measured them every month regardless. And for you know, how long? Um, we're, some of them still come in. So. Okay, They're like not, a, not all of them. No. There's like, uh, I, I, the, the total of number that were in the program was 300, 309. And um, some of them just want to come in to make sure that they're staying on track and they stay in the weight, in the weight loss area. What was the level of significance? I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah no, no. You know, uh, how significant was the the mean drop? I mean, they, I'm assuming that those were all oh, significant. You know, yeah. Yeah. levels of yeah. Um, yeah. zero oh, zero one. Yeah. Okay. Zero one. Um, and this uh, this study is a group of researchers that I work with uh, all over the country, actually. And um, we have a couple, we have about five papers now on uh, processed foods and addictive behaviors. Mm -hmm. One is a medical hypothesis that looks at the relationship between refined carbohydrates, um, obesity, the increase in obesity, and um, addictive behaviors. And basically, um, if, you, if you study the biology and neurobiology, you can see that the you neural know, pathways um, of neuroaddiction and pain and pleasure, pretty much they overlap. You know, there's a lot, there's more and more research that shows that they overlap. And um, there are several neuropeptides involved in those pathways and they pretty much all overlap. And if you look at, um, you know, the consumption of refined foods from 1970 to 1999 and the absolute increase you'll see that the consumption from, you know, just a, some random products from 1970 to 1990 has really also increased. What are HFCSs? Oh, I'm high sorry, high, high fructose corn syrup, oh. which is in everything. Yeah. It is. You know, it's in our soda, it's in food products. If you look at, at any of the um, uh, food products that you buy that are uh, packaged food products, it's in everything. Okay. And there's some really interesting studies with rats and how they respond to high fructose corn syrup. <clears throat> and who hasn't had the cronut or you know any of these other things? I haven't had the cronut, but it's scary. <laughs> it's scary. Yes. Um, you know, there's some. If you think about, it, there's some fundamental difference between refined foods and unrefined foods, and some of these differences, for instance, the refined foods, there's some research now to show that some of the refined foods may, you know, if, you know I'm skeptical, um, you know, I'm, I'm not totally on the bizarre end of things, other than me just being bizarre, but, you know, um, you know, some of the, when I was down in Atlanta, I was at a chiropractic hospital, at, or, uh, uh, university, and everybody was glucose and or uh, black, um, Oh, um, gluten intolerant. That's that. Yeah. Not everybody's gluten intolerant. No. Okay, <laughs> but there is some interesting research, research to show that our our flour and everything is so refined at this point that it may be leading to a higher prevalence of um, you know some of the intolerance with the wheat. 
higher protein content for mechanization of the cooking and packaging process. Mm -hmm. <laughs> where, yeah. where our unrefined foods have more vitamins and minerals. <coughs> you know, they have um, they have a lot more um, uh, nutrients that they provide for our bodies. And again, I'm in the area of calcium and vitamin D, and you know, my, my research is my original research demonstrated that you know it's too late by the time you're 21 to give calcium. But we don't know what else besides the calcium, you know, in food is not being provided. You know, if you take a calcium supplement, what else is in the food that we need? Nutrition is relatively a young science. So there's much more to be understood. Um, but what we did uh, with our hypothesis paper demonstrate was that the DSM uh, substance dependence categories will really come, you know, we can demonstrate with all of the different categories that there, um, you can show a food addiction to all the different categories. For instance, these are the categories Progressive use over time, withdrawal symptoms, use of more than intended, try to cut back, spending time pursuing um, and using or recovering from use, missed important activities, um, using in spite of knowledge and consequences. Let me just give you a couple of examples. Progressive use over time. We have demonstrated with our chart, you know, with the one that I showed you, that there's um, markedly more use of, of the different substances with withdrawal symptoms. I eat sugar-filled foods to correct being tired and or depressed. These are clinicians that are working with these individuals. Use more than intended. How many of you eat more than so of something than you intended to? I know I eat a lot more Ben and Jerry's than I intended to. <laughs> try to cut back. Individuals consistently try to cut back on a food item and are unable to. Potato chips. Yeah. Ever tried to just eat one? <laughs> Spend more time pursuing, using, or recovering from. I, I have a to-do list that I never ch that never changes because I can't. I have to nap all the time after eating. Missed important activities. I don't go anywhere anymore because I don't like my sides and I don't have the energy. I haven't danced in years. Eating in spite of knowledge of the consequences. I have not thought. I I, I have thought. Um, I have the thought that I shouldn't eat something, but I go ahead anyway. I rationalize eating. Uh -oh. Sounds like we all have that. Yeah, <laughs> I've heard yeah. all of those in my, in, yeah. when I work with clients. This week? <laughs> this week. Hey, <laughs> okay, I've used them. I've used them. Yeah. You know, I'm not perfect. Yeah, right. So, in the last uh, studies that I want to talk about, we, we published about three articles out of this study. It was a major multidisciplinary study, and um, I'm very proud of it, and this is where I really like to go, except I can expand it. And the first part of it, or it was one part of it was uh, based on my thought, and I'm sure you all feel that way, is that we eat because we're stressed. And, you know, here I am. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and there was a book a long time ago, this is the newer edition, but there was a book a long time ago called Slim Chance in a Fat World. And it was really about behavior modification, but it had some substance to it about, you know, basically we need to modify our behavior. And one of it didn't talk about stress management, but it was leading in that direction. And there was a guy I worked with at Syracuse, and he went back with uh, Penn, and he does some work on uh, stress management and overeating. And one of the things, if you think about it, what do we do when we're stressed? We pick up things and we eat. And so with my kids that I worked on, and I was really looking at what happens to bone density if you lose weight in kids when they're accruing 50% of their adult bone. So I needed them to lose weight. So we did a stress management program. We did progressive relaxation, we did um, massage. These were kids at Tanner stages two, so they were like 11 years old. And um, we found that it really helped them. They, their anxiety levels decreased. We also found that, I would, and I'll tell you, um, that we found some inter interesting things about their families as well. So these were our kids. Um, we had 100 that started out, and I'll tell you that we had a waiting list of about 250 to get in our program. Mm -hmm. And these were kids that didn't, some of them didn't meet our criteria. We had this one woman in Cincinnati that 
begged me on the phone for days on end to get her daughter in our program um, because there are a lot of kids that are obese. Um, and so this is just a little bit about the demographics of our, of our program. And we provide stress management, we provide breathing and uh, breast relaxation. We also did some exercise, and which was important for their bones as well as stress. We provided an educational program for the parents. I had a psychologist on our team, and he was a child psychologist. He was excellent. And he also picked out that a couple of our kids were in abusive homes. He also picked out that several of our kids had parents with eating disorders. Um, so he was, he was just um, a godsend to us. And if those kids have those issues, I can't help them change their weight, you know? So those are things that are really important. Um, here are some facts. We did the uh, revised children's manifest anxiety scale, and um, here's some of the um, uh, data that we, we were able to change uh, statistically significant their total anxiety and their worry and oversensitivity. And that was over a one-year period. Let's go past the live. Um, yeah, it's yeah. live. That, and and this is rationalize or yeah. what does that mean? Um, I'm not, you know, I'm not the psychologist. Okay. The room, but <laughs> it's, it's, this is a validated, reliable okay. survey. We bought it and followed them. That's curious. But, you know. Yeah, some of them, you know, some of them, and, and that may, I don't know. Do, Joanne, do you have any, if you use a survey? It's just, just what is the bottom? The lie. The, the, oh, the lie. It's, it's only, uh, the way the test, the particular test, because I'm familiar with this one, is constructed. It has questions in the test mm -hmm. that uh, oh, repeat oh. themselves in the and oh, them yeah. sort of yeah. And if you get opposing mm -hmm. answers, right. it gives you <coughs> a right. ratio of, of the yeah. validity right. of yeah. the other answers. So okay, yeah, you, you want to keep them under a certain value. Mm -hmm. I can't remember what the yeah, it was. Okay. Quite so that if you know they're lying. Yeah, then, then you, you have to throw that data out. Right. You really can't rely on it. But, Thanks. but many of the um, standardized psychological tests mm -hmm. have the lying. Okay. Thank you, John. You're welcome. That's right. To take a test as human. <laughs> so watch out. <laughs> They check you social online. acceptance. So we had two here, social acceptance and athletic competence. Okay. We did we did do a lot of exercise with them and got them to exercise. I can't wait. Thank you. Thank you. So um, and I one of the things I wanted to say about this study too with kids is that stress is highly correlated with obesity. There's more research coming out to show that um, stress can lead to um, loss of uh, muscle, osteoporosis, increased, increased blood, blood pressure, uh, carbohydrate intolerance, and dyslipia. So, um, you know, it's a really important factor in reducing the stress if you want to uh, lose weight. The last area was um, where um, I started out was this um, correlation between low bone mass um, and losing weight. And just some statistics, low um, osteoporosis is low bone mass, uh, four, uh, four times more likely in women than men. Uh, Caucasian women are more likely to be susceptible to osteoporosis than men, particularly slight women. And that over 52 million Americans right now are presently afflicted. And by 2020, we see that jumping to 61 million Americans with um, the age of population. And there's um, good data to show that uh, adults that undergo weight loss surgery will lose bone, um, whether that's from the changes in their metabolism, whether it's changes in weight. There's really inconsistent data, but there's some good data to show that people that lose weight, again, whether it's weight bearing or whether, you know, um, adipose tissue secretes estrogen and it secretes lots of other things. So whether it's the weight bearing or whether it's the loss of adipose tissue, people are losing weight or they're losing bone. Um, some other uh, research studies show they regain the bone. 
So again, the reason I wanted to look at it is if you're having children between 9 and 13, when they're accruing 50% of their adult bone, are they going to, are they going to, if they lose weight, are they going to also lose bone, which they may never regain in their adult years? Kathleen, did you just say adults gain, can gain back bone mass? Some of the studies that I've looked at, they will, they will lose the weight, they'll lose the bone, and then some, some of the studies show that their bone, they regain their bone. So with some of them have been inconsistent. I get that. You know, but uh, mine is the only study that has looked at children, got them to lose, uh, and it's not a whole lot, because remember, they're gaining height, you know, so they're growing, but the uh, essence, and I went over this again, so it was an interdisciplinary study, talked about that, we were looking at um, BMD changes at peak bone growth period. And these were, you know, some of the information about the kids. And in essence, um, this is um, some of the demographic data, their changes over 6 and 12 months, and the change at 12 months, but this is where it really got interesting, is that as they, uh, they're, Again, they were they were growing in height, they were changing in weight as well, but we did see that normal growth in bone over one year for children this age would be nine percent per year. Their change was only six percent. So they slowed down in bone growth. And you found that adding calcium didn't help that? They had plenty of calcium. Right. They ate a lot of calcium, they had weight bearing activity. They we reduced their stress now, not everybody, because we had some kids that were in a very stressful situation. So the fact that kids now are not taking in as much calcium as they used to because they're not drinking milk and, but and they're, some and of they're overweight. A lot of pizza. Right. And, when, and they're overweight. Now we get them to lose weight, they're gonna be have their little body body mass, so we're gonna have more hip fractures, which means we're gonna have more early deaths and complications. If if we if we are able to get kids to lose weight. We couldn't really have a problem in our hands. Did you tell them longitudinally at all to find out if they ever regained it? Yeah. Or is that physiologically? No, they actually, after the study, I left the town. I wished I could have. Mm. And that's where, I, that's where I'd like to go. I'd like to do two, yeah. two different types of studies where we can do them all together because I like to put everything together. I'd like to explore this high protein exercise counseling and, and look at cortisol. Um, C-reactive protein left in ghrelin and a peptide Y in adults um, because um, you want to, with the study I did with David from Chicago, we did not look at some of these proteins and we also did not look at what happened to bone because there's some evidence that if you take a lot of protein, you could influence bone. So I'd like to look at that in, in adults. But for the kids, I definitely want to repeat this study. The reason I'd like to re uh, create a summer camp is I'd like to get some of these kids away from their parents. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I love parents, but some of them are not a good influence on their kids. And if you can, if you can teach kids good nutrition programming, even if they have to go back to their parents who may not be a good influence, at least you try, you've taught them something. And then start measuring um, some of these you know, these proteins and peptides because, um, it, you know, those can tell you a lot about what's going on in the body. And, um, and then also look at this food addiction model, which I think could be, you know, if they're low income, it could be a real factor for them. And um, I'll also increase the protein because it, it also has a good, it has a longer satiety period.